Republican presidential candidate Tim Scott unveiling a new economic plan. He calls it Build Not Borrow. Senator Scott joins us now. He's a lead Republican uh, on the Banking Committee, and it's great to welcome you uh, on the Squawk Box, uh, Senator. Thank you oh, you Good are welcome. Um, we might need a plan. I, I, the latest from the Census Bureau uh, median real income for Americans was $78,250 in 2019. Um, 2022, it was down almost $4,000. We've got nowhere. $74,580. What does your plan do to try to reverse that trend? Well, one of the things we have to remember is that under Joe Biden, we have 52 consecutive paychecks where our spending power went down. One of the ways that we can increase our spending power is to lower the tax burden on our paychecks. My plan cuts taxes, which requires us to cut spending and cut government as well. So think about the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that I helped write. That provided the average family about $4,400 back in their paychecks. They got to keep their own money. Let's do that again. Let's make those tax cuts permanent, not just let them in in 2025, but let's make them permanent. At the same time, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is a very interesting name for Joe Biden's plan, increased taxes. We have to rescind those tax increases and eliminate the 87,000 IRS agents that will be hired over 10 years so that we focus more of our attention and our time on the things that encourages and creates economic activity in our nation. We also just heard so far debt, debt service, and it's, we should know this. We we're talking about the Fed. We just saw what the ECB did. So $800 billion uh, so far. That's going to put the, the deficit this year at $2 trillion. But all these yes. things, I, I, I don't see how you're going to cut taxes and, and think the, isn't the deficit, that's going to worsen the deficit, isn't it? Well, we should, no, well, we should take a look back at the results of the TCJA in 2017, 2018, what we saw with lower taxes. We lowered the corporate tax from 35 to 21. We lowered all the uh, taxes for on the domestic side. We saw revenue to the Treasury go up in 2019, again, as well in 2018. So we saw two consecutive years of web revenue growth to the Treasury at the same time we cut taxes. I believe the Laffer curve still works, frankly, that the lower taxes creates and encourage, encourages uh, capital from, to come off the sidelines. And when that happens, you see growth to the revenue in, in the Treasury. We saw that in 2019. We saw it in 2018. I believe that if we cut taxes again, we'll see that same trajectory Thanks. that will stimulate growth in our economy. And frankly, we have to bring home jobs, reshore jobs, from around the world, and that's why my Opportunity Zones 2.0 is so important. Senator, there's no question that there was additional revenue. I don't think anyone's going to debate that. I think the question nope. is whether there was more revenue than there would have been otherwise to actually fill the gap. And I think there's still a, a, a question mark at that point about whether that was the case then and would have continued to be the case. No? Well, we could look back at the uh, the Bush years or the Clinton years and see what tax cuts did then. We can, frankly, go back to the Mellon tax cuts in the 1930s and see that revenues went up. We just had too much spending. We see that time and time again. The Reagan years saw the exact same thing happen. You cut taxes, revenue goes up, but spending exceeds it. And so what we're seeing in the Biden years is even though we have had a lower tax environment, when you have $2 trillion of overspending or 40% more spending than revenues come in, of course, you're going to have a large deficit. That's why we are looking at a $2 trillion deficit this fiscal year. It's not simply a revenue problem. It's a spending problem. That's why my plan not only does it cut taxes, it cuts spending. We have to get back to the pre-pandemic level of spending when it comes to non-defense discretionary spending. That's the way we we write the ship. So let's put specifics on that then. What, what would you cut and, and what third rails would you touch? Yeah, so the simple answer is first you increase, you extend the current tax cuts beyond 2025. You reduce and rescind the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. And then you look at spending. The first thing you do on spending, you reinstate all the welfare reform work requirements that allows us to reduce our spending on welfare programs by encouraging work. The fact, the fact of the matter is a simple one. In America, if you're able-bodied, you should work. We should also eliminate all of this conversation and the spending around reducing the, the college, uh, college education costs that we see in the student loans. By reducing that, we're talking about 
currently between 100 and 400 billion dollars, depending on what happens to the Supreme Court on the next iteration of Biden's desire to make student loans free. Somebody's got to pay it. My mom taught me if you take out a loan, you should pay it back. And so those are just two very good examples of reducing our spending by a half a trillion dollars. If you went back to the pre-pandemic levels of spending on all non-defense spending, you're probably saving somewhere between two and two and a half trillion dollars. So we're, we're talking about significant in a 10-year window. We're talking about significant transformation of America's economic future by going back before there was a crisis. We are not in the middle of a COVID crisis. Why are we spending like it? Senator, how, uh, just switching gears, how do, you, uh, how do you envision the campaign playing out? What, what, what is your game plan to get to the, uh, the goal line uh, on this? You, you see that former President Trump's numbers are, are daunting. Uh, when Senator Romney said he wasn't going to run again, he said, you know, there's too many Republican candidates. Uh, it, that's, you know, when you split up all the Republican primary votes, that just, uh, you know, adds to, uh, to President Trump's ability to, to secure the nomination, probably. W- what is your strategy? How do you think it's going to play out for you to get there? Well, I can could, I could tell you what's working already, both in New Hampshire and Iowa, where we're actually campaigning. Uh, our message, a, co- a optimistic, positive message anchored in conservative values and conservative principles, resonates really well. It's one of the reasons why our town halls are packed, standing room only, and our numbers in the polls continue to go up in those two states where we're campaigning. So what we've learned is that the power of persuasion is a necessary component for the next American president who happens to be a Republican. That's why I'm running for president. I'll say two things. We've lost seven out of the eight last national elections. We can do better as a conservative party. We do that by attracting more voters to our side of the aisle by talking about those issues that impact them. We spend so much time talking about candidates and opponents and not enough time talking about the American people and the challenges that they face as a kid that grew up in a single parent household mired in poverty, I can tell you that America can do for anyone what she's done for me. The, uh, the school system, you're a, tr- a big charter Oof. school guy. Is that, is that correct? Is that I, I, I absolutely believe in educational choice, whether it's public, private, charter schools. I want parents to have a choice so kids have a chance. Yeah, and, and that is not popular with, uh, with, with a lot of parts of the, uh, you'll never get, uh, you'll never get something like that en masse uh, through a, uh, if either house is controlled by the Democrats, it's not going to happen uh, with, with their, I, I think with the, uh, their sort of attacks at the hip with the teachers unions. Well, what, 100% you said it right. In order for us to see that happen, number one, you have to have an optimistic, positive messenger at the top of the ticket that creates a red wave. We win back the majority in the Senate. We expand our majority in the House. And at the same time, we break the backs of the teachers unions that are literally standing in the doorhouse stopping poor kids from finding the right path for a better education. Here's what we know. We spent over $700 billion on K-12 through education as a nation, and comparatively speaking to our OECD competitors, we are falling and trailing behind. The only way to change that is to introduce competition. We're all on a, on a show that talks about money. Competition means that the price goes down, the quality goes up. We desperately need that in education, but we absolutely have Democrats who are wed to the teachers' unions trapping poor kids, too often minority kids, in big blue cities, devastated by poverty, high crime, and very little hope. You can restore hope by giving a parent a choice, a child a chance, and desperately needed in places like Chicago, Los Angeles. Chicago, they're spending $30,000 per student. My goodness. And those kids still can't read on grade level. We can change that devastation almost overnight with a Republican administration that focuses on a great opportunity party. Hey, Senator, uh, you've been clear about your position on education and uh, teachers unions. Uh, We've been talking all morning about the UAW uh, in the fight that it's uh, engaged in now with the big automakers. Uh, They, of course, seeking something on the order of 40 percent increases in terms of uh, some of their pay pay right now. Some of the offers have been in the 18 to 20 percent range. Um, Where do you stand? Who do you support in this? 
Well, I, I, I will say I, I support workers. I mean, when you look at my state, South Carolina, one of the things I did as a state legislator, I said that we should use our right to work laws in South Carolina to attract new businesses. We are now in the, one of the destinations of foreign direct investment. One of the classic examples of that in the auto industry would be BMW. They came to a right to work state. They've expanded their their uh, local manufacturing location. It's the largest in the world for BMW. We have Mercedes cre creating their Sprinter van. We brought Volvo in as well. What we've seen is the ability to attract auto jobs into a state that has competitive wages without being burdened by the unions. That actually is the best way for us to, c to create a path forward for the American auto worker. Frankly, I say move it down to South Carolina and throughout the South. You'll have a better better wages, better quality of life, and better benefits. So then uh, what, being on the... What, I was just going to say, that what, what was your reaction? You know, UPS uh, had its own battle uh, with the unions, and, and ultimately it appeared that the unions were quite successful. Um, you know, somebody working there at the highest pay is going to make $170,000 a year. Unbe unbelievable. Here, here, here's what we have to think to ourselves. Uh, I'm on the Finance Committee. One of the things that we wrestle with are when unions go belly up, the government comes in and steps in and provides 20 plus billion dollars to reshore and stabilize their benefits packages. I remember sitting in a hearing and a widow came into our hearing. She was promised four thousand dollars from her husband's union benefits. Unfortunately, when they crashed, she started receiving a thousand dollars a month, which of course is the, the federal the federal guarantee is twelve thousand nine hundred dollars a year. She was devastated by that. Yes, they're winning the battle today, but they lose the war tomorrow because they overpromise and underdeliver, and then the taxpayers step up and subsidize that because the radical left continues to honor the promises that we didn't make to folks that don't work for the government doing so by taking taxpayer dollars like my mama, who, who, who worked for a little bit over minimum wage, and now she's subsidizing the union plans of a 40 percent increase. It's just not effective long term, but it certainly sweetens the pot. It's quite seductive on the front end, but it's Ooh. devastating on the back end. Senator, we, we like having you on today. The, the, the road to the nomination uh, goes through Squawk Box. I don't, I don't know whether anyone has said that to you, but we certainly... We, we I knew it was South Carolina, now Squawk Box, uh, too. I'm coming back, baby. I'm coming Squawk back. Squawk Box and South Carolina, but, but uh, we do have viewers that, that need to hear your, your message, and we hope to see you again. We appreciate Look it. Look forward to that. Oh, okay. Squawk Box will be right back.